the average trucker takes 50 minutes to find parking on average mm. um, that the, on a daily basis, which is crazy to think about. And another number is that for every 11 trucks, there's one parking space available. Mm. You're listening to Freight Famous, presented by Rose Rocket, bringing you the people that make trucking move from behind the scenes into the limelight. Here's your host, Justin Bailey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Freight Famous, a podcast produced by Rose Rocket. New episodes of Freight Famous will be released about twice a month. On this podcast, we talk with our guests about how they build, scale, and automate their trucking, transportation, or businesses that support trucking and transportation. Uh, so today, I'm going to start with a new preamble, uh, which says, before I introduce our guest, I'm excited to tell you about Rose Rocket's TMS referral program. If someone you know is looking for a TMS, Rose Rocket would love to have you join our incentivized referral program. To learn more, email us at referralpartners at roserocket.com. That's referralpartners at roserocket.com. And a member of our team will be in touch. Now we're going to go back to what you would be used to hearing. I'm your host, Justin Bailey, co-founder at Rose Rocket. I'm super excited to introduce my guest today, Evan Shelley. Evan is a truck parking expert with a deep knowledge of the business. As a CEO and co-founder of truckparkingclub.com, he uses his experience uh, in truck parking in real estate uh, to work, help solve the truck parking shortage and bring awareness to the issue. And I do have to say, this is something that I've been hearing an awful lot about uh, recently. This is uh, this is so this is topical, and I'm curious to learn more because uh, you know I'll be first to to admit I don't have a ton of um, I don't have any firsthand uh, experience with this, and, I, and I'm relatively unknowledgeable on on the space. So uh, super interested to learn more, and I uh, hope you all are too. Uh, hello, Evan, and welcome. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Cool. So, um, yeah, man, just a little bit about uh, why why did you start Truck Parking Club? And sorry, is it Truck Parking Club or Truck Parking? What's the, give me the... Truck Parking Club. Dot com. Cool. Why'd you start it? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, back a couple of years ago, I was doing a lot of real estate, land deals, land development deals, and... I came across a deal uh, that was zoned industrial, and I was looking at it as a possible warehouse project. And ultimately, it wasn't a great use for a warehouse, but through talking with brokers and investors, I found that there was a huge need for truck parking. And so I went to the municipality for that particular property, and I said, hey, I want to do truck parking here. And they said, even though it's zoned industrial, we're not going to allow truck parking in this area. I was like, it's perfect for truck parking. And they're like, no, we're not going to do it. So I knew there was a demand for it. I knew there wasn't enough of it at that point in time. And then I had quickly experienced a situation where I couldn't make more of it. So that got me very intrigued. And from there, I started talking with more and more people in the space, um, in logistics, in truck parking and in in trucking in general and did find that it's a huge issue and with traditional real estate development it's very it's gonna be very hard to build the number of spaces needed um and that ultimately through those conversations over the course of 12 to 18 months uh got me to truck parking club so um it's just if I understand based on our conversation earlier, you know, it, it would it sounds like this is really sort of shared economy, a model. Um, you know, I'd reference it's it's kind of like Airbnb for for truck parking, which I think is a nice heuristic to think about. You know, it's it's pretty easy to understand how that makes its underutilized capacity, uh, you know, repurpose for you know an obvious need need in the market. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about like how much of a problem is this from a so I started two prongs to this question. One is like, you know, some numbers or, you know, kind of like shock me or scare me with some numbers in terms of like how big of a problem is this? And I'm curious to like, what do people do today? I'm actually, these are two things I don't have, have good knowledge on myself. Yeah. So the numbers that a lot of associations and people throw around is the average trucker takes 50 minutes to find parking on mm. average. Um, that. The, on a daily basis, which is crazy to think about. And another number is that for every 11 trucks, there's one parking space available. Hmm. 
which is pretty insane. Um, and with to follow into your last question, uh, there was just a huge wreck on an interchange where a Greyhound ran into three trucks. I don't know if you heard about that, but it, it actually got a ton of notoriety in mainstream media. And what was happening was the trucks had to pull over somewhere couldn't find parking. So they were parked on the shoulder of an interchange and then a Greyhound bus hit them. And I, I believe three people died. So that's ultimately um, an example of truckers doing the best they can to find parking and then it being an unsuitable location. And then unfortunately some bus swerving off the road, just enough to hit these trucks. Um, so that's one example. Um, and I think truckers are just doing the best they can, to be honest, uh, with what they have. When you're thinking about developing uh, sites, and 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 when I say developing sites, um, you know, working with uh, with with I guess landowners or development companies or whomever who might have space that could be repurposed for truck parking. Um, again, two prong question: uh, How do you how do you know where the best spots are based on like freight is kind of everywhere, right? And so it's like really anticipating where you're gonna get um, utilization. So you said, for instance, that first location you looked at, you said, this was this is really good for truck parking. Why specifically there? Yeah, so in that particular scenario, a couple of years ago when I was looking at that as a development opportunity, it seemed that the demand was very high for, for trucks to need to be in that area. That area was central Florida, which is still a huge problem. Um, but for truck parking club in particular, you know, there, there are obvious areas like central Florida, South Florida, um, New York city, uh, LA, those obvious areas. We, you know, we would love to continue adding more and more spaces there on top of what we already have, but you, you made a good point. Freight is everywhere. We have rural locations that I, to be honest, when the property owners added them, to a truck parking club, I would have never thought they would have gotten bookings, but they get bookings because freight goes everywhere. And it's those rural areas where they don't know anyone or have any connections that we actually provide a lot of value there too. And you think, well, there's just space everywhere. Well, is there space where it's a vetted location where they feel okay about it? Not as much as you would think. So we, we do want more uh, parking in the areas that need it the most, but we also um, welcome any locations, even very, very rural locations, because we do know there's there's a need there too. What's um, what prevents? And we don't have to keep picking on this this situation in Georgia. We can kind of go anywhere. But what? Why would why would it be a problem to truck park trucks? Like, why do people not want trucks parking places? What's the what's the objection from the landowners, developers, cities? What, like, what's what's the problem? Um, there is an assumption that having trucks parked anywhere close to your residential property is going to bring down the value of it. Mm. Um, then the annoyances of a truck, uh, running, there is sound associated with that. Um, so those, those are going to be the common complaints. Um, any like commercial retailers don't want necessarily want trucks anywhere near them for the thought that it's going to affect their business. I don't know if that's actually true, but that is the assumption. Um, so it, it's the traditional, you know, NIMBY, not in my backyard, don't want it anywhere near me if I think there's any negatives to myself. But I would roll that into saying, uh, I think if these, these people that have those opinions, if someone talked to them for five minutes about how actually not wanting trucks anywhere close to you can really affect your price of goods. Right. Um, it can ultimately come back to uh, affect you more than you would think um, by being so against having more of more truck parking in, in your area. So it's a complicated problem. I think that will continue to be alleviated by educating those people, educating the municipalities on how important this need is. Um, and continuing to create more of it in um, many different means, such as kind of what we're doing, um, but also traditional real estate development, you know, 750 million toward rest stops and federal 
um, federal funding is going around right now. So all these things um, are pushes to to really help alleviate that problem. So marketplaces are hard to build. Um, and you've got the, because you've got obviously both supply and demand that need to be kind of, it doesn't need to be perfect. There's a bit of a chicken and egg. This one feels... Um, bring on the supply of parking spaces and and the trucks will follow a bit if I were to think about how I would you know do this. Um, how have you found the reception for the park spa- parking space owners for lack of a better term? Um, how's that been in terms of I'm really I'm just curious around that acquisition model and if that's been really tricky if it's been a no-brainer for them. Um, how just as a, like from a you know from a founder to a founder how how's that how's that been? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't get that question very often. Um, so we call them property members. So they're mm-hmm. hosts. Uh, traditionally, Airbnb would call them a host. A lot of marketplaces call them hosts, but we call them property members. Um, you know, I would say 90 plus percent of all of our locations are inbound from finding us online, whether it's social media, podcast, mainstream, logistics media, uh, They because they read the article or listen to the podcast and they say, I have five extra spaces Mm -hmm. in my yard and I'm a trucking company or we have users, truckers that are using us in Houston, but then they have a location in California and they're like, Oh, if I'm using this here and I'm parking at this trucking company's yard, dropping a trailer there, I'm going to put mine on the platform. So we really have spanned. We have a lot of members that span both sides of the marketplace, which is, wasn't necessarily planned. Uh, It's cool to see as the business grows. Um, but to answer your question, you know, we're very focused on adding more locations while also main, maintaining, uh, a really great customer experience for the trucker when they use our product. We're insanely focused on a great experience and great customer service. Um, so adding the properties is one thing and making sure that the property members, everything runs very smoothly and we automate everything to where they're not worried about running a truck parking business that we cater to, you know, do most of that for them. Um, and then also making sure that once the trucker hits our app, that they have a great experience in getting the booking and getting to the property. And if they do have an issue that, that when they call into customer service, that they have a great experience there. Um, one of the initiatives we have is hiring drivers uh, in our customer service team. So our drivers, yeah. our, our customer service team is, currently made up of only drivers and i expect that the majority if not all of our customer service hires um at truck parking club will be drivers because when we have drivers call in and they're talking to someone that really doesn't know the how difficult it can be to not just the career but just to find parking at the end of the day and they're talking to someone that does understand and then on top of that they've had some type of technical issue or customer service, uh, a technical issue or an issue with uh, getting to the property, pulling into the property, whatever, and they're talking to a trucker, the entire relationship changes at that point. Um, so that's one of the things we're very focused on. Yeah, it's a pretty cathartic feeling, I think, for someone when you have, it's you almost like the, we actually talk about this with some of our um, our domain experts, even at Rose Rocket, you know, when they come to the room um, with a bunch of um, operators, say from a trucking company or, or a brokerage, uh, and and the people in the room with them have been in their shoes before. It's almost like it's like a uh, like the, the the temperature just goes way down and everybody's cool. You know what I mean? It's this that there is that that and that's a, that's a good play and good on you. To, you know to think that through. One thing that that occurred to me as you were mentioning that, just thinking about what would be challenging versus say a traditional marketplace. It's like we'll go back to the Airbnb example. Um, and again, this isn't a, this isn't perfectly linear, but in my mind, it's like you rent a place on Airbnb. The place is booked. That's and it's for sort of a determined p- amount of time, and the hosts I think are are pretty deeply engaged. But and this is just an assumption I'm going to make, and I and I make this with you know we have you know well over a thousand trucking company customers, and I've been working with trucking companies for almost a decade. Um, sometimes they can be uh, maybe not as as responsive. So I guess where I'm trying to go with this, it's like how do you manage the spaces available? Because I feel like there would be this not this perfect compliance around like we have five spaces in our yard. 
but there's five trucks already there, but we didn't have to update the app to say that they're still there because one person had to lay over a little bit longer. Like it's a tricky actually, because it's, 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 not, a, it's not a perfectly um, defined space with walls and a lockbox to get in. And it's like, and maybe it is actually, maybe you can talk a bit about that. Like how do you kind of create that sort of official designation and have it be really binary around this is empty, this is full kind of in, you know, real time to keep that going. I imagine that's a, that's a challenge you're, you're working through and, I, and I'm wondering how you think about that. So uh, when I first started the company, what you exactly said was one of my biggest fears. Mm -hmm. I was very concerned about that. I was like, we're going to start getting bookings and bookings on over the top of other bookings and their space is going to be taken and we're going to have horrible customer experiences and we're going to lose all of our customers and the business model isn't going to work. I wasn't going but that far thousand, with it, but I, uh, but I appreciate it, the I mean, anxiety. But it, yeah, well, <laughs> it, yeah. it only takes a few bad reviews in the beginning. Right, um, right. Fair enough. So after thousands of bookings, um, you know, 112 properties now, um, we have had... I believe one situation where someone booked and it was a mistake. Um, so it's how is that possible? It's just I I think for business owners, they are more conscious of what's going on than the average person would think. So huh. like we like these business owners, a lot, uh, a decent amount of them being trucking companies are, are very conscious about that. They ha like work with truck parking club and they keep their site updated. And I would say one of the other things we caution them on is like, if you have, you know, let's say 10 spaces available, you know, make sure you have wiggle room. If you have carriers coming in or whatever, you think there's a case, like worst case scenario, you're only going to have three, then put three. Yeah. Like, don't like, we're not trying to, you know, eh, like, <clears throat> in a sense, we put we we caution them to put buffer in at locations and, and things of that nature. And I'm 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 not lying to you when I say we've had one instance and we got that person actually moved down the street to a location. Fortunately, um, so through good customer service, we got it taken care of quickly. But it that was one of my biggest fears with this company, and it just hasn't came came to be um, all right let's, let's try the, let's try the reverse of that then what is what has been something that has been surprisingly challenged that may be challenging that maybe you didn't anticipate early yeah that's a great question uh just getting initial momentum was insanely difficult right it, it was horrible um and you get you get your first booking and you're like wow someone actually used my product and then you get your second and then your third and then you're trying to in the beginning you know i was trying to talk to every single customer and then it uh, the day comes where you can't even keep up with the customers and you, you're getting your 10th, 20th, 30th, 50th booking. Um, uh, and may, like during that period of getting those early adopters to use your product, which isn't perfect, um, dealing with the mistakes that come with that, your product doesn't work correctly. So they call into customer service. Are you going to fix their problem as quickly as possible so you don't lose that customer and that customer tell 10 other people how bad of an experience they had with this new company? Like, I was maniacal about it. So uh, that, I guess, is how we got through it. If someone had a bad experience between me and the lady I was our first hire in our customer service, like, we were just crazy about dealing with those issues as quickly as possible. Um, and we're just hyper, uh, hyper focused on making sure the trucker has a great experience. But that, that was extremely painful like getting that started we're fortunate now to where uh, it's building on itself which is nice i'm i'm not saying we have what you know in a marketplace you would call like that inflection point or escape velocity but it is nice to feel the momentum of the business feeding on itself mm -hmm. um i would say that that's the the toughest part it was it was very very difficult and uh i'm from what you've said, you understand marketplaces really, really, really well. Um, and with the questions that you're asking me. And so uh, I would say that was it, just getting that initial momentum because there's a huge graveyard for, for marketplaces. You know yeah. that, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah so. I mean, there are, there are arguably the hardest businesses to build, uh, you know, and so. Oh. Is if that? you get there, yeah. if you get there, yeah. If, yeah. That, that's the thing. It's the it's the hardest business model to build. But if you ever get to that inflection point or that escape velocity, it's the best business model to have. Yeah, as, as they t as the, those 
those are usually one will beget the next, right? It's it's hard for a reason. It's all the cliches. If everybody, you know, if this was easy, everyone would do it and, and, and on and on. And I agree with that. Once they start going in that inflection point. But to your point, I think those it's that that zero to one stage. And I think what I heard in there was um, kind of the the answer within the answer. There was there sounds like it's it's technically very hard, right? Because you're using your your user base is um, it's a very difficult product to the only your <laughs> Your customers are your QA in this model. It's like they are testing, does this thing work even? And the only way to really know is to let it let it loose. And so, and to your point, I think especially in this industry, um, it's it's an industry that will reward um, good delivery of product, service, and promise. And it's a, and it's an industry that will pu- that will be very punitive towards the inverse. So I think you, you it felt, sounds like you thought about this completely the right way in terms of being very obsessed around that customer experience because this is you know an industry that there's a lot of these guys talk a lot. And so it, it word spreads. And so I think that you know by by being by being thoughtful about that initial customer experience and kind of doing whatever it took to get through the initial look and no product's very good when you ship it. If you've, you know, if you're not embarrassed of your first product, you waited too long to ship it anyway. So it's got to, it's got to kind of uh, suck out the door, right? I was very embarrassed. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> I created, well, you, you I created did it my just, first product. Oh, good. Then yeah. you did it. You just shipped right in time. Exactly. Yeah. The more humiliating, the, the, the better your timing and, was. And someone used it. Yeah. And that's when I was like, Oh my God, someone used this thing that I yeah. created. Um, isn't that just a mirror? Isn't that a miracle? Like, isn't that yeah. just those moments you're like, Holy shit. Like this went yeah. from an idea and I built a thing and someone actually thought enough about it. And I hit the right person at the right time. And in some ways it's like, if, if no one ever touched it again, there's success in that. <laughs> I don't care. Like there's success in that yeah. moment. Like it hit somebody, somebody had a need. I wasn't just, you know, completely hallucinating in terms of this, this being a need. Cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of second guessing and doubt, you know, in the, in the buildup of the, before you get there and you launch it. Right. And you're like, man, this, I might be completely yeah. wrong about this. And so yeah. one person is like, well, dude, if you can get one, you can probably get 10. So, I mean, it's a nice, and if you can get 10, you can get a hundred and so forth. So, um, that's great, man. I love, I love this. This is a good story. And I have to say, like, just as we're sitting here having this conversation, um, I'm loving this business. Like I just, I love it. And, and I love things like, I think the name is perfect. I think the name is is literal. It's you know what it is in the website. It's it's just it's kind of no nonsense. And I and I just I think it plays perfectly into this industry. Even like the logo, like on the shirt, like this is it's a spot. It's it's a it's a well timed. I think well delivered uh, product without seeing the product, but at least product promise. Um, that from where I kind of sit, and I think it's uh, I, I think I think this is great, man. And it's one of those businesses I, I find that when I hear about a business that tends to do really really well. And I hear about it for the first time. I'm like, oh, that's so freaking obvious. How come I didn't think of that? And I think you've kind of got one of those where it's like, this is so obvious, but it's it hasn't been done. And and you know, good for you for executing it. Good for you for executing on something that's, you know, that that is a real problem. So, how um, like how much does this cost? If I'm like, what do I pay to use this? And um, what's the what's the deal? Yeah, gotcha. Um, so a trucker will go into the app and. I have a location, let's say in Savannah, they need a spot and it's, let's say $25. So their cost is $25. And then we do a rev share model yep. where we take a cut from the property owner. Um, and, and that's it. That's, that's how we monetize is taking a cut from the property owner. And, you know, our value to the property owner is we're handling customer service, pre-booking, we're handling reservation management, payment processing, billing, obviously marketing um, and we're, we're bringing them a, a network of truckers that go all across the U S. Um, so our property members see the value in just automating that for them, especially, you know, most of our property members are business owners. They aren't truck parking operators, right? So they're trucking companies that have the space and understand truck parking inherently but to say, I'm going to hire someone to run this business for my 10 extra spaces in the yard, that's just not realistic. And so we provide the value of automating that for them. It's also revenue that they otherwise aren't getting. I mean, this is your, it's not, and you're really, like you said, you're managing the whole thing. And I think that the key thing is, it's like, if I've got, if I'm sitting here on 10, 10 spots in my yard, um, 
besides putting a uh, you know a, a sandwich sign out on the road saying truck parking, let me administer this for you at two thirty in the morning. There's not really yeah. uh, there's not re- you're not you're just nothing like you're gonna do with that anyways. It's gonna remain underutilized and empty until the you know product like yours is available to post and advertise it. So again, I think that I think the model's nice too in terms of this. This it's it's a well understood model. Um, you know, you're not the you're not inventing uh, reinventing the wheel here on how these these shared uh, you know sort of gig economy type type models work. So um, I think it's well understood, and I think whatever you're charging is is probably well well worth it because it's otherwise money that would just not be available to the to the owner of these lots, especially in in, in the fact that it's not professional truck parking companies that already kind of have, uh, you're not competing with them within their own business or trying to like, you know, it's it's your, this is free, this is clear air, it's a total green space. So it makes, it makes a ton of sense. And the trucking yards, again, it's like when we first started talking about this conversation, I wasn't conceptualizing where these spots were. I was thinking of actually a, like a Walmart, for instance, and, and saying, we'll, you know, designate this. It's like, oh man, it's so like challenging. And I'd hate to work with those, those, you know, those um, developers and, and it's kind of just get, but obvious. And again, it's like, obviously that makes a lot of sense. So more sort of obviousness in this business, which is, is really, it's really great. So how do you kind of plan to take it from here to where you want to go? And I guess there's, there's two parts. It's like, where do you want to go? What does this look like? You know, what's the, what's the, the North star here and what else can you do? I mean, I've got ideas in my mind that start looking like, upsells and add-ons and things like this but i'm curious if, if we're thinking about the same things yeah so where we want to go is five to ten thousand locations we're at 112 now five to ten thousand is very doable uh hopefully we're surprised to the upside on that ultimately um and to be honest man we get approached with all, all kinds of different ideas constantly and i have just been hyper focused on just making sure that we're in truck parking we are truck parking and the experience is great for customers on both sides of the marketplace and i really i say no a lot Good for to you. like any of these other ideas that come along i mean a common one is people are like why don't you park rvs and i'm just like i don't like our branding is so clear and yeah. i i don't want to change that branding at all and there's there's a lot of other things uh issues you can get into with doing rvs at the same time as truck parking um but that's a common one and i I would just say like we're so focused on this and yeah we have a path for our product um that we want to add a few things in but to be honest man like you've got craigslist and you've got airbnb right and they're probably like as far as marketplace models they're they're pretty different as far as uh, how they uh, a customer looks at them, and we're probably somewhere in the middle. Like what we care so much about is that a trucker can get onto our app, get the space they need, and booked as quickly as possible with no frustrations. Um, that is all we're really concerned about. Um, so I, I mean, I. I don't look at a ton of other things outside of that because I don't want to lose sight of what the, what the business is. I mean, yeah, there's, I get approached constantly and there's ideas I have. I just, I don't really pursue them typically. That is a phenomenally mature uh, answer. Um, And that's, and that's, that's actually really hard to do. And that takes great discipline. Um, and I think that that's a good, it's an interesting call. I was going very different directions with that, but I think that's, that is completely the right answer uh, in terms of, because you like, if the mission is five to 10,000, which is a pretty divergent number, by the way. So it's like, do you get to, if you get to five, are you there? Or like, like those are two different numbers. So I'll take you, I'll, we'll call it 7,500. Um, and when you talk to me in the future, you know, yeah. it could, it, that number could change drastically again. I don't, you know, that's just, a feeling we have yeah, that yeah. it's going to be in there somewhere. But Well, and you think you'd almost take the number of like, you just, you said, uh, now I'm going to take, you'll say that there's out of every 11 trucks, there's one parking spot. Maybe not all of them need parking. So it's like, what is the total addressable market for parking? And the idea is you reverse engineer into that to say, okay, well, that's 7,700 sites would roughly satisfy the, you know, entire, you know, United States trucking short, parking shortage. That's kind of, you know, that feels like we're how you've got here. And so, and from that point, I think that's when you can start thinking about RV parking or maintenance or, you know, all these different types, all these, I mean, there's, 
uh, you're in real estate development. You probably got all sorts of thoughts around that that area as well, like how this thing can get really, really kind of ugly. Um, from but from an expansion perspective, you can see how this can start to work. And if you've got captive users inside your app, what do you do with those? And um, I'm not a focus guy, and so I actually have a lot of. Um, um, a lot of regard for for your answer there because it's an answer that that I've struggled through my career to give. It's one like that. Like I listen to that, I'm like, oh man, that's so that's so ninja of you. Like I just wish I could say that sometimes too. You know, like saying no is something that has come to me a lot lot later in life. So uh, you know, good for you for having that because it is it's it's in my opinion from you know kind of looking back, it's it's the right thing to say. Yeah, no, I I appreciate that. Uh, to be honest, I. You know, I had business experience with my real estate companies and and was fortunate to be successful with that. And I, I was focused on those businesses, but I would say a lot of that answer just comes from studying people that have done it, you know, like that just listening to interviews with people that have done it and then just applying it. You know, I uh, focus is one of the most common words that very successful business people use. And, you know, I, I try to reflect the same because I, I see the, I see where we're headed. I see the opportunity we have. And and for me to go off, you know, and push in another direction, I think would be a mistake. So I, I have ideas and, and, and things and, but I just don't spend too much time on them um, because I know we're, you know, if we stay focused, we're, we're headed in the right direction. Are you a solo founder? Is it just you? Uh, no, I have a co-founder. He's just not active in the business at all. Right. Okay. Um, he's more of like a, a chairman type role. He was an early founder and, um, but I run the company and um, make the decisions in the company at this point, but we're hiring a, a lot of strong people um, very focused on that as well. Like just putting, adding really a players that can help this company grow because I would say we're a tech company. Yeah. But our customers especially on one side of the marketplace with the trucker and you you understand this very well like you even mentioned it earlier like they don't resonate with your traditional silicon valley tech right i mean that's a that's an that's an obvious statement but so it's not just about hiring for for me how i think about it it's not just about hiring like strong technical staff it's also hiring people in the team in sales and relationships and customer service that resonate with the users that power this platform, which is it's the trucker. Um, so I think I've spent a lot of time thinking about that and making key hires for that um, with with people that build the company in a way that reflects the that ideology. How do you make sure that that doesn't get too throttled in one direction? And where are you yeah. balance that? Because that that's got risk to it in its own right. I agree. That's a great question. Your your like your questions are awesome. Um, to be honest, man, I don't I don't necessarily have a a barometer for that. I yeah. mean, I would love your insight. Like, what do you think? How how would you think about that? I I don't necessarily have like oh, I've ticked too far one way or the other way. Really, um, I I feel like how I currently do it is, you know, I sit in the middle and I have my, my technical guys and then I have my sales marketing and customer service and I bridge the gaps on product. And then hopefully I can give my technical guys like the right feedback. And I, I and I also get my, teams both all of them on calls at the same time mm -hmm. uh where it kind of bridges over but i i'm i'm no expert at this stuff man i i i don't i don't claim to be i just um so i would love what do you think about that like how do you yeah and i asked it because it's actually pretty it's a it's a hard um it, i think your answer is it's accurate in terms of like and if there is a barometer then you know someone listening let me know what it is because i've not <laughs> seen like a good like here's the exact amount of sort of non, we'll just use like terms like, you know, non-transportation to transportation or non, you know, kind of like, you know, outside experience where you want these, um, you know, like for your business, it's like, wouldn't it be helpful to have a product manager from Airbnb who understands high velocity marketplaces and things like this and how that all kind of works from a, from a back end and a B2C user experience and things like that. But then at the same time, it's like, 
you don't want to lose the tune either. So I think like I, it's the way that I've thought about it. And I, and I, this is just, this is only an experience of one. It's that I have found that I'm, I'm, I tend to be wrong 60% of the time, roughly. If I kind of look back at sort of big, like big, th- like big opinions that I have around the business or had around the business, I'm like, this is the way it has to be. I'd say like 60% of the time in those I've been, I've been wrong. And so what I've started to try to do is optimize against strongly held beliefs that I have. So in this example, I was a firm believer that we couldn't have enough domain expertise on the team. I think to your point, you and I were very, were very similar in that, that I was probably overly obsessed with, with domain expertise because I would see what we talked about earlier, this like this temperature go down in the room when experts were on hand, this really good feeling around, um, you know, all the things, but at the same time, because early days we were building, it was, it was maybe a little bit different in that when I think about this, I mean, I think I'm going to angle this a bit more technically. So when I would think about bringing technical people that maybe had say in this case, worked on a TMS before the thing that started to occur to me as we, as we were kind of looking down that path was these people are coming with preconceived notions and pre-baked recipes for how this is going to look. And we are trying to do something different and, 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 and really thread the needle between the most advanced, meaningful, and powerful technology, but serving this particular industry versus recreating what's already been created, like in the cloud, quote unquote, just for something that's different. So I think for me, what I recognize that I, I was I was optimizing heavy for um, uh, for domain experts. And so if I knew that naturally that my tendency was to do that. So if I started to not optimize for that, the default would still be probably a 50, 50 mix because no matter what I do, it's such a natural tendency. It's like, I don't, it's almost like I don't need to double down on what I already want to do. I don't need to dump, double down on my confirmation bias. So if I try and distance myself from it, that confirmation bias will still represent like 50% of what I'm going to do anyway. Like I can't, it's like, it's inherently in me. So I'm not going to move off of that. It's almost a value. So it's like, I almost had to fight against my own inclination to, I think, work on, on getting, the balance. I know that's super meta, but I I, I don't know if that yeah, kind of answers. No, that's great. No, I can I can resonate with that. <clears throat> I think I yeah I do definitely challenge. Typically, if I have a question that I'm asking myself about the business, and um, I know I'm probably biased in one direction, I'll get like one or two people from uh, very opposite opinions. Yeah, and then like talk with both of them, and then like, see what the conclusion is that we come to, and then. On top of that, like, so when we build product, so my customer service team is made up of truckers, right? So I bring the leader of our customer service team and my CTO on a phone call and we go through product together. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's an amazing thing to like listen to and watch. So do you sit sit as the product manager in this role? I'm yeah, I'm I'm hyper focused on products. Okay, so like, your product your product in that conversation, you're representing product. Yeah. yeah. It, it, but and and you have to think the the lady that runs our customer service, former trucker, had used our product, mm-hmm. which is amazing, one of our first customers. And mm-hmm. she's using the product on a call and we're talking with her, my CTO sitting there and letting her identify all the issues. And then when she comes to an issue, it's like, is, is it her? Is it, is it uh, a UI? Is it a backend issue somehow? Like, and then we talk through it and then we make it, and then we understand what the fix is for it. If there is a fix. Mm-hmm. Um, but from a product perspective, that's how we handle it. Yeah. Um, so I have my CTO, which is not really necessarily a product guy, but very skilled in what he needs to be skilled in. And then I have, um a user that work that you know works for us um and just giving she just i'm just like give us raw feedback and then we do a screen share and go through mm-hmm. the product and then, then when the issues come up we just talk through what's the fix here um so from a product perspective that's how we do it and that's worked well um as far as like culture and things i i you know i'll take what you said and and I run with some of that as well. Um, Just remember, still, I want to catch. I am. I'm still. I'm still wrong sixty percent of the time. So that that's hey, that's four hundred. <laughs> You're batting four hundred. <laughs> I guess it was baseball. It's great, but there's a lot of other areas where that gets me fired. Um, <sighs> so yeah, no, I think it's. Uh, I think it's an interesting problem. I, I, again, I, I like the way you're approaching it, though. I like the way you're thinking about it. I think it's. 
I think it's the right way to start is what I would say. I think from a starting point and being, um, you've used the word maniacally multiple, multiple times. And if you're, you know, I think that level of customer obsession, like you're thinking a lot about, I, you're thinking about this the right way in terms of create extraordinary value in, you know, and all will follow, right? It's lead with that. That is the leader of all things. And we can create extraordinary value. I don't, you know, call it what you want, good culture, money, growth, whatever is your, whatever floats your boat. That's the long tail of extraordinary value creation. And so you're, you're totally doing that. You're thinking about it the right way and you're leaning into that. And it sounds like even the decisions around is like, does this create value? Does this create extraordinary value even? And yeah. there's not a business that I'm aware of that's ever lost playing that game. If you look at any business that loses, it's they lose the value game. They lose value creation game. Like, it, it, almost like 10 out of 10 times. That's, that's, that's it. unless again, like, like embezzlement or something like that. But even if they're doing shit like that, they're probably not drilling a lot of value either. So you become, there is a point where you become too big to fail and people listen to this and be like, yeah, that company doesn't create any value and they're still so, super huge. It's fine. They will die, trust me, at some point. But the reality is the game is all about value and breaking into markets and breaking into things is about, it's, it's about creating outsized value, extraordinary value, enough that you can get people interested to do it and then maintaining that level all the way through to build up enough of, uh, uh, you know, enough momentum um, to do what you're doing now, to get a place where the product, you know, you're talking about this, it kind of, it starts to feed itself a little bit. Momentum starts to grow. And, um, you know, man, it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to listen to. And, and I think it's, it's just nice to talk to someone who's thinking that way and building something for the industry that's, that's needed. Um, like this checks all the boxes. You know, if I'm sitting here right now and I'm like, hmm, should I invest? Like you're, you're, we're having a conversation and this is like a, uh, you've sent me a deck and you're raising money. I'm like, this dude checks every box right now. Like this is an every box checking. So the investors that listen to the show, um, are, yeah, what are you, what, I should maybe even ask you that. Are you guys like a venture funded company? Are you bootstrapped? How, how do you, what are you doing there? Yeah, so bootstrapped so far. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate in real estate to to do well over the last several years and have, have funded the company. Um, and with that being said though, we are ta actively talking with investors and, I would guess we will close a raise by the end of the year. Yeah. Um, we are having conversations with investors all the time. And I think you can probably resonate with this. We're just very focused on having the right investors, the right partners that reflect, you know, what we're trying to do and have the right relationships. And so it's not, I mean, we, we have, we're fortunate to have people with capital that they're in, but for us, we also think about, okay, that's great. We have capital that we can use, but are they strategically a fit for us? Um, and so that's that's kind of what we're going through now is narrowing that down. Let's do something for the for the listener group, for the for the folks who are um, you know thinking about starting stuff or, or, or kind of in that that place. And I think there's a lot of general. I think a lot of people who haven't been through this, and that is that is most people haven't been through starting a business, raising venture capital. Like it, it, you know, it's it's the world in which I've lived in, and sometimes it feels like oh, everybody's doing that, but you kind of step outside this. Like it, most of the world has no idea what the hell this even is, right? And so it's like, I get think for the people on the outside who are curious about this, when you say you're looking for a strategic investor, what does that mean to you? Okay, so you know we're fortunate to be just a, a very fast growing company month over month over month. And I personally, I've never been a part of a company that's growing like this. So I'm learning as I go. Imagine bringing on a capital partner that says, I've been a part of 10 companies just like yours and led, you know, a large percentage of them to uh, great success through what we know or a company I created or I have relationships that will, or my LPs are, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that's that's how I think about it is providing real value and not just a check. Um, a, a check is valuable, mm -hmm. I understand, but it, that's the perfect scenario is someone that says, yeah, I'm gonna write you a check, but also you know, with what you're doing, we can help you manage this, 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 and this. We can guide you in the right directions because we've done it. Not because they say they can, because they can give me five examples of how they've actually done it. Um, to me, that's that's how I think about strategic partners. So relationships, understands business, understands building, you know, a business model like a marketplace. Um, that that would be a great fit. You're a, you're a 
uh, success is a formula guy for sure, aren't you? You see that you basically look at this and you're like, you template it and you see that there is a, um, there's a formula and a template to success. And if you kind of look under the hood of all of these things, it's almost done the same every single time. And so, and I, and I can see, and I can hear this, you've mentioned some things along the way that are giving me clues to this about you. And it's that you're, you're even just said it there. It's like, I'm looking for an investor that's done this before because I'm not so, um, bullheaded in that I'm just going to say like, I know what I'm doing and I'm going to invent all this stuff. How much time can we save for somebody showing up and say, I've done this before, do this, don't do that. And just follow the instructions becomes pretty, yeah. pretty, I don't want, I, I was gonna say it becomes pretty easy. That would be a complete fabrication. It doesn't <laughs> become easy. It, uh, it, but it becomes a little more clear in terms of what you have to do next. And you made a really, I think an important point is that you haven't been here before. And it's, and it doesn't matter if like, you know, even past businesses have had success, you arrive them in a very different way. There's a very different kind yeah. of business. And these, these have very different types of challenges and metrics that need to be driven to. And it's just, it's a, a business is not a business in this sense. The venture businesses are a complete world unto themselves. They even have really different accounting principles to them. I mean, they, they kind of are very, like to say they're non-traditional is an obvious statement, but they're, they're fundamentally different. And so having that sort of help and support and people who've been there before to do that, again, man, I think that's super wise. And I think that's a really good approach to how you're thinking about, you know, raising the next uh, or your first, your first round of capital, um, whether this be a seed round or a series A or whatever you guys are going to call this. But I think it's a, uh, I, uh, you know, man, again, I think you guys are going to, like you said, you're going to raise money by the end of the year. I, I, I don't see that being a problem based on, you know, the, just even meeting you and hearing you talk through things and the way you're thinking about this just feels, uh, it feels, it feels pretty on point, man. Like, I think you've got, you're really onto something here. And again, it's solving a, it's solving a real problem. Uh, and people are getting real value out of it. I just, at the end of the day, those businesses win. Yeah, no, I really appreciate, uh, the kind words, man. Um, I, I would just say like, I enjoy listening to and studying people that have done the things that I want to do. And that, sure. that's well, kind of, who, who do you like? I mean, you, you have the, you have the obvious like ones that everyone says, like the Warren Buffett's of the world. I think that's where I just like keep saying the word focus is from someone like him uh, that, you know, that, that has become cliche, I guess, but he is, he is phenomenal. I guess someone more, um, you know, closer to, I'm 29 and, and someone that's closer to kind of my age is a guy named, uh, Alex Hormozy. I don't know if you're familiar, but no. he, um, he's already had some substantial exits and he's like 32 or 33. Um, and he has, he's pretty successful on, um, in terms of social media and, and outreach and things like that. Now he just goes and buys companies, but some of the things he talks about um, as well, I, I really look up to. Um, and I, I would say, honestly, though, it's probably a culmination of 20 or 30 different books and a few different podcasts I listen to all the time. Uh, like a, a podcast I would say I listen to all the time is like All In Podcast with mm -hmm. just like four great entrepreneurs. And I just genuinely enjoy listening to their thoughts about things. Um, so it's a culmination of a, a lot of different things, but those are some that come to the top of my mind, um, when I'm thinking about it. Yeah, that's great, man. Um, I think that's good. So yeah, I mean, we're going to, we're going to go there. I think that's, that's a good way to go out. Just a little, uh, little vignette for those listening. And if you want to follow some of those folks and kind of get to the same, the same headspace as, as, as Evans, and this is a strong, um, this is a strong, I, I'm really, it's really interesting just getting kind of to know you at this sort of stage of the business. Cause man, I think you're going to blow up and it's, it's cool to be, uh, it's cool to know you now before you're famous. So, um, I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you joining us and, uh, uh, thanks for spending this time and, and, and sharing. Hey man, I appreciate you having me on. This is, this has been a phenomenal podcast. I've, you've like the, some of the questions you've asked have been very thought provoking and I, I do really appreciate that. Okay, man. Well, hook me up. I'd be happy to see and talk to you again. Um, let's not be let's not be strangers. It's a, it's a small enough industry that uh, we can be friends. Yeah, that sounds great, man. Okay, buddy. All right. Be well. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.